Kate, we are so happy to have you and grateful that you are willing to share your knowledge and share your experiences with us. So with that, I'm going to say hello and turn it over to you. Hi, good morning, Dr. Scott. I'm so excited to be here. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak today. So I'm going to talk to you folks about convict leasing, and so I'm just going to share um, my presentation so that you can see it. That's not what you think we did. No, I've seen you talk several times. That was on my best. There we go. Hopefully, folks, that'll pop up for you. Can you see that presentation, Dr. Scott? Can you see my presentation? Is that uh, streaming for you folks? Okay, perfect. Wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to be talking to you folks about convict leasing because it's a topic that I think is often under addressed in public schools. We seem to focus a lot on slavery and then with that reconstruction. Um, but then, you know, we jump into the civil rights era and all of a sudden it's the 1950s and 60s. And so that period in between often gets lost, but there's a lot of significant history that happens there that's, you know, directly correlated to disparities that exist in the United States today. And so I just wanted to take a few minutes and touch on um, this, this topic that's often underrepresented, and hopefully it gives you more insight into that system and then, you know, gets people thinking about it and wanting to learn more. So that's my focus for today. So, you know, what is convict leasing? Oftentimes, I find that people have never heard of this system. Um, it was a system in which individuals, usually black males, were forced to provide labor for either private individuals, let's say like a farmer, um, or a company like a coal mine, to pay off fees and debts. It came into full force after Reconstruction. It was a direct response to the end of slavery um, and a desire to continue using African Americans for cheap labor or free labor. And it lasted throughout the first decades of the 20th century. Um, most people are familiar with its successor, which was chain gangs. Chain gangs um, did not end until the 1950s, and it was a system in which governments were using convicts to do state projects, like labor on state roads and things like that, which is a little bit more visible. Um, so how did this system develop? Well, after the Civil War, laws were passed that criminalized the everyday behavior of newly freed slaves. And these laws meant, in practice, that Black individuals, particularly in the South, were vulnerable to arrest at pretty much any time. And once they were arrested, individuals could often not pay the fees that were accrued throughout the court process. So even if you were found not guilty, these fees would really add up. You would pay for your own prosecution. And so at the end of that process, um, people would find themselves in debt. We also had situations where people accepted what was the equivalent of today's plea bargains in order to avoid harsher sentences, and those things often involved fees as well. And then what would happen is an individual or a corporation would agree to take on those debts, and um, the person would be expected to engage in forced labor until the debt was paid off. And of course, that was determined by the company when that was paid off. And so they would work in private industry. And this was a money maker for the state who was receiving money for these convicts. And then it was a boon to these corporations that got free or often um, very cheap labor. So because um, our focus is slightly on Florida today and we're looking at some of the laws that they have passed, um, I pulled up the 1865 Florida State Constitution. And so the convention that created this document um, was tasked with creating a new legal code that was in line with the 13th Amendment's uh, prohibitions against slavery. And so this resulting code um, was very clearly designed to uphold white supremacy in the state. And it criminalized a wide variety of black behavior. And so if you look at the slide, I pulled out a few excerpts for you. Things like owning a weapon, um, intruding on an assembly of white persons, being unemployed, committing adultery. All of these were crimes for which black persons could be arrested in Florida. And then on top of that, there were laws called pig laws that existed in Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama, and Florida, which took crimes that had been misdemeanors and transferred them into felonies, which had harsher sentences. <laughs> 
1877 in Florida, um, the legislature approved an act that allowed the government to lease prisoners to individuals and private companies. And the justification for this is that these prisoners were a burden on the state because the state was paying for their food and for their housing and for them to be guarded. And so this would pass that burden on to private entities and these private companies would pay the government for the use of these convicts. To give you an idea of the scope of this, so focusing in on Florida, between 1877 and 1919, about 14,000 people were sentenced um, to private labor camps throughout the state. The vast majority of these prisoners were black males, um, and they were leased to individuals and corporations by municipal, local, and state governments. And like I said, even if the person was not convicted of a crime, let's say you were picked up on some bogus vagrancy charge, and by some miracle you were able to prove your innocence and be found not guilty, you still owed these court costs, which were often so expensive um, for these poor workers that they could not pay them and they would still get caught up in the system of convict leasing. We also can look at graphs and see that these arrest rates mirrored the needs of the community. So for example, when it was planting season or harvest season, you see um, higher rates of arrest, which also indicates to us that this wasn't about fighting crime. This was about finding a cheap source of labor. So this quote um, by Frederick Douglass gives us some insight into the cruel punishments and squalid living conditions that convicts faced while they were part of the system. And it's, you know, it's interesting to understand why the conditions were so horrible. And it's because these companies and individuals who invested in convicts had very little investment in those workers. Unlike the period of slavery, when slave owners had invested huge amounts of capital to acquire slaves. I saw one of the presentations last night. Um, it was mentioned that a male slave in his prime was worth more than $50,000. That's an incredible investment that the slave owner would have made. They did have some incentive then to keep that slave relatively healthy, relatively well-fed, well-clothed, well-housed, to, to some degree. Obviously, not always, but to some degree. But the companies and individuals that use convict labor had almost no investment in these individuals, and so they did not care for their welfare at all. In fact, the, the only incentive they had was to work them to their absolute limit. Um, and if a convict died on their watch, there was absolutely no consequence for that and they could easily acquire another at a very low rate. So let me give you some statistics here that shows what we're talking about. In Alabama, in 1873, 25% of black leased convicts died, so one in four, so it's very high death rates. And then looking specifically at um, prisoners who were leased to work on the railroads between 1877 and 1879, the death rates were 16% in Mississippi, 25% in Arkansas, and 45% in South Carolina, so almost half of those workers. These workers were dying from outright torture and beatings, um, and then just neglect, dangerous labor conditions. We're going to talk about the coal mines in a second. That was one place that was particularly dangerous. Um, disease that would spread through the convict population, and then unsanitary living conditions like poor drinking water. And like I said, if a convict died in the hands of one of these private leasers, um, there was absolutely no penalty for the employer. So in Florida, um, it's already low labor costs were further undercut by the use of convict leasing. Black Americans who were arrested for minor or just questionable, outright questionable offenses became caught up in the system of forced labor. By 1910, the lumber and the turpentine industries were the largest in Florida, and those industries employed over 37,000 people, but the pay was low and the work was extremely difficult, and the use of forced labor and violence against workers was really common in both industries. Workers who tried to escape were chased by armed overseers on horseback, and you can see at the image on the right, um, the overseer that's like looking over the turpentine workers. Um, workers could not quit if their debts were not paid. And it was legal for convicts to be whipped, like with leather straps, which is obviously reminiscent of punishments that slaves would receive during slavery. <laughs> 
There was a famous case that brought attention to this system, and it involved a white 22-year-old from North Dakota who found himself convicted of vagrancy in Florida. He was sentenced uh, to 90 days um, of hard labor for what he had done is he had illegally hopped a train. So he, had, he was on a train without a ticket. So he gets sentenced to 90 days hard labor, and he was leased to the Putnam Lumber Company to pay off his debt. His family had actually sent $25 to pay his fees and it was kind of mysteriously lost at the sheriff's office. So he sent to Putnam Lumber. Um, to give you an idea, in the 1920s, Putnam Lumber was paying the Leon County Sheriff about $23 per convict. So we're talking about very low investment. Um, and while he was in the custody of Putnam Lumber, Martin Tabert, this 22-year-old, um, was whipped by a supervisor approximately 150 times and left out in the Florida sun um, and when he was finally, you know, given medical attention, it was too late. He died. And then they just sort of unceremoniously buried him along the side of the road. And, of course, this was common practice. Um, many Black convict lease uh, victims, you know, were killed in this way. But because Tabert was white, this case got a lot of attention. And convict leasing officially ended in Florida in 1923 as a result of that case. So I want to, um, you know, I always try to make, things real. Like for my students, I want them to, you know, hear about individual stories. And so I want to tell you a little bit about um, Green Cottingham. So Green Cottingham was arrested in Shelby County, Alabama on charges, uh, charges of vagrancy. He also, like Tabert, was accused of riding a train without a ticket. Um, and this was on March 30th, 1908. Vagrancy in Alabama was a crime that was almost exclusively charged against black men. He was convicted and he was sentenced to 30 days of hard labor. But during that criminal process, like we talked about, he was charged many different fees, including those that had to be paid to the sheriff, to the deputy, to the county clerk, and to the witnesses who testified against him. And at the end of it, his fees were totaling um, $38.40. And so because he could not pay those fees, his 30 days of hard labor were extended to almost a year. He was purchased by U.S. Steel Corporation, and he served his sentence under that company's control. He was put to work on Slope 12 in the Pratt Mines near Birmingham, Alabama, which is shown in the image on the slide. There were about um, a thousand other convicts laboring in those mines, and each day, um, Cottingham was required to collect eight tons of coal under just truly horrific conditions. He... Um, face the very likely possibility of succumbing to disease, which was widespread in the mines, and also had to worry about violence, not just from the overseers, but also from other prisoners who had really just kind of lost their humanity being trapped underground in these mines for weeks at a time, cut off from family and friends, and, and really feeling, you know, completely hopeless in these terrible situations. So there was a lot of violence. And individuals who died in the mines were either buried in these unmarked graves, like on the periphery, or they were incinerated in ovens on site. Um, after five months um, working in these mines or laboring in these mines, Cottingham was diagnosed with syphilis. And it's very likely that he actually had that illness before he entered into the mines, but the harsh conditions he was facing there exacerbated his symptoms, and he had extreme pain. There are medical records that talk about his loss of mobility, like having trouble walking, and he was having trouble eating as well. In his weakened state, he ends up contracting tuberculosis, and he dies on August 15th, 1908. And his death is logged in the company's records, but there is not accurate information about exactly where he was buried. And his is just, you know, one of the many um, often untold stories of individuals whose lives were lost because of convict leasing. Um, and there are many, many others that are not well-known or publicized. So who is benefiting from this system? You know, convict leasing resulted in the industrialization of southern states after Reconstruction into the 20th century. It provided cheap labor for agricultural production and for growing industries. And we're talking about industries like coal mines, lumber camps, turpentine production, brickyards, railroad quarries. Um, it also provided a steady stream of government or government funds, government revenue. Um, so let me give you this example. So in Alabama in 1883, about 10 percent of the state's revenue came from convict leasing. But by 1898, it was almost 73%. So 73% of Alabama's state revenue was coming from this convict leasing system. 
The broader effects were also felt um, on the paid labor force as well, because lease convicts weakened the power of organized labor um, to fight for better working conditions and higher wages, and it also prevented strikes from being successful. It kept wages low for all workers in the economy, and it raised unemployment rates throughout the states where this was practiced. As Frederick Douglass's you know, comments on this slide show, it was well known that convict leasing was not about punishing crime and was instead a for-profit industry benefiting local officials and corporations at the expense of the African-American community and other members of the working class who were not Black. So what's the legacy of this system? I always try with my students to connect things to today because nothing happens in a bubble. Prison labor um, is still widely used throughout the United States. I pulled up the example of California. In California, um, 70 factories are run out of the state's 33 prisons. Prisoners are used to work in textile industries, construction, manufacturing, and a variety of service industries. They do tasks, everything from making clothes to working in dental labs to managing dairies. Um, they are not protected by any of the labor laws that exist, so they get no minimum wage, they don't get overtime, they can't form unions, they can't collectively bargain. And today, like back then, most of these workers are people of color, particularly men of color. And so this system continues to benefit the states who run these prisons and these private companies who are benefiting from very low labor cost. In 1890, um, you know, when the system was in full force, 90% of the prison population was black in the United States. And the long-term consequence of criminalizing black behavior and imprisoning large numbers of black men was establishing a relationship in American minds between criminality and blackness. And that still lingers today, or con and not even just lingers, continues full strong today. Um, at the time, high rates of black imprisonment were used as evidence that people of color were more likely to commit crimes, when in reality, they weren't committing crimes. They were simply being arrested on specious charges in order to find you know, a source of labor. Statistics were used to argue that emancipation had been a mistake, and it was said, oh, you know, slavery ended, and now we have all of this crime. The graph on this slide um, shows the number of people incarcerated in state and federal prisons per 100,000 people, and you can see that by far the highest rate is among America's Black population with 1,096 per 100,000 people. I also know that in um, 12 states, more than 50% of the prison population is black, which is obviously grossly disproportionate to their population size. And because convictions have long-term consequences, um, including many cases, you know, losing the right to vote, losing access to different employment opportunities, having um, loss of access to public programs like food stamps or public housing, this high rate of imprisonment perpetuates economic disparities and has really far-reaching effects. Many of the economic and educational gaps that exist today can be traced to the system. And you know, while many of us were taught in school that slavery ended with the passage of the 13th Amendment, slavery really didn't end in the United States until convict leasing ended, which was in 1942. And we're talking about only about 80 years ago. So this is not ancient history. So if you would like to learn more about this, um, the resource that first introduced me to this topic is Douglas A. Blackman's Slavery by Another Name. He provides a really detailed account about how this whole system developed, its key features, and he goes into detail um, about something I didn't talk about, which was during the progressive area, how the Teddy Roosevelt administration and the people, um, some people in the South, some reformers, tried to end convict leasing. And one of the things they fought against which was peonage, which was like an adjacent system of debt slavery. Um, and there was a, some very interesting court cases and things that happened there. They also made that um, text into a PBS documentary. And for people who are specifically interested in Florida, I had to do a little research on Florida. I didn't know much about it. Um, the Making of Florida's Criminal Class, an essay by Connor Donegan, I thought was really helpful as well. So hopefully um, this very brief discussion prompts you to learn more and explore some other areas of Black history that are often neglected in classrooms. So um, 
Dr. Scott, I just want to thank you guys for letting me uh, speak this morning. I hope that was uh, helpful and informative. That was helpful, informative, and excellent. Convict leasing is one of those aspects of American history that very few people are aware of, and it is so relevant because it ties to modern-day mass incarceration. You did a fabulous job. I love that you had the, um, the resources at the end as well. So thank you very, very much for doing that. And thank you for doing it so early. And thank you for exposing the kinds of history that people are working very hard to find.